So welcome everyone to the Open Hardware Summit. Um, this is our sixth summit, is that correct, Alicia? Yes. Um, this is our first summit on the West Coast, so we're excited to be here in Portland. Uh, we have speakers coming. Uh, we have speakers here from India, Korea, Lebanon, most of Europe, um, and the Americas. This year, we've had a record number of backers for the Ada Fellowship. We've been able to give 10 full scholarships, as well as uh, 25 summit-based scholarships for women and people of color to be attending the summit this year. And thanks to the community and the backers and all of our sponsors for making this possible because without you, we would not have been able to do this. So I really, really appreciate that. Uh, since this is the Open Hardware Summit, I'm going to briefly explain to the speakers and the audience how it's going to work. Uh, you each get 15 minutes. I'll be in the back here uh, with these numbers. At five minutes, you get this number. I'll be flashing it sort of frantically. And then you get the one minute, also frantic. At that point, you should be thinking about probably rounding off whatever it is you want to say and be getting off stage. Uh, all of your slides are already preloaded, and if they aren't, uh, the, the man in the back with the plaid shirt on who is now waving will be the one probably yelling at you. Uh, I also want to mention really quickly that we have Open uh, Source Hardware Association Oshawa memberships available downstairs and online. This is another really important way to be active in the open hardware community and it's making the summit possible year after year. So um, thanks so much. I would like to uh, invite our keynote onto stage. Uh, sorry, I can't switch the slides. Zach showed you guys how to do it. Um, so this is Allison Parrish. She's a hardware hacker and I would say Code Ninja, based out of New York City, who's doing some fascinating things, and I would like to welcome her on stage. I'm going to need just a second. Wait, where are my slides? Okay, how's the sound? We good? Okay. Um, well, there are a lot of you here today. <laughs> That's super exciting. Um, so, I'm just going to start. My name's Allison Parrish, um, and I uh, have a little talk prepared here. The title here is on the screen Programming is Forgetting Toward a New Hacker Ethic. I love that word toward because it instantly makes any talk feel super serious. Um, so I'm just going to begin. Uh, every practice, whether technical or artistic, has a history and a culture, and you can't understand the tools without understanding the culture and vice versa. Computer programming is no different. Um, I'm a teacher and a computer programmer, and I often find myself in the position of teaching computer programming to people who have never programmed a computer before. Part of the challenge of teaching computer programming is making the history and culture available to my students so they can better understand the tools I'm teaching them to use. Um, I'm going to show you this slide. Uh, this talk is about that process. And uh, the core of the talk comes from a slide deck that I show my beginner programmers on the first day of class. But I wanted to bring in a few more threads. So be forewarned uh, that this talk is also about bias in computer programs um, and about hacker culture. Um, maybe more than anything, it's a sort of polemic review of Stephen Levy's book, Hackers, Heroes of the Computer Revolution, so be ready for that. Um, the conclusions I reach in this talk might seem obvious to some of you, um, but I hope it's valuable to see the path that I followed to reach those conclusions. So the quote here is um, from an amazing essay called A Non-Euclidean View of California as a Cold Place to Be uh, by one of my favorite authors, Ursula K. Le Guin. Um, it is about the dangers of fooling yourself into thinking you've discovered something new when, in fact, you've only overwritten reality with your own point of view. 
So let's begin. Um, this is Hackers, Heroes of the Computer Revolution by Stephen Levy. Um, so this book was first published in 1984. And in this book, uh, Stephen Levy identifies the following as the components of the hacker ethic. Um, access to computers should be unlimited and total. All information should be free, mistrust authority, promote decentralization. Uh, hackers should be judged by their hacking, not bogus criteria such as degrees, age, race, or position. Uh, you can create art and beauty on a computer. Computers can change your life for the better. Now, Levy defines hackers as computer programmers and designers who regard computing as the most important thing in the world. And his book is not just a history of hackers, but also a celebration of them. Levy makes his attitude toward hackers and their ethic clear. Um, through the subtitle he chose for the book, Heroes of the Computer Revolution. Um, and throughout the book, he doesn't hesitate to extol the virtues of this hacker ethic. Um, the book concludes with this quote, this bombastic quote from um, Lee Felsenstein. Um, it's a very fundamental point of the survival of humanity in a sense that you can have people merely survive, but humanity is something that's a little more precious, a little more fragile. Um, so that to be able to defy a culture with states, thou shalt not touch this, and to defy that with one's creative powers is the essence, the essence, of course, of the hacker ethic. And that last sentence is Levy's. He's telling us that adherence to the hacker ethic is not just virtuous, but it's what makes life worthwhile. It's the, the survival of the human race is dependent on following this ethic. Hackers was reprint, reprinted in a 25th anniversary edition by O'Reilly in 2010. And despite the, the unsavory connotations of the word hacker, like the criminal connotations of it, hacker culture, of course, is still alive and well today. Some programmers call themselves hackers. Um, and a glance at any like tech industry job listing uh, will prove that hackers are still sought after. Um, contemporary reviewers of Levy's book continue to call the book a classic, an essential read for learning to understand the mindset of that mysterious, much revered, pure programmer that we should all strive to be like. Um, Hackers, the book, relates mostly events from the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. I was born in 1981, and as a young computer enthusiast, I quickly became aware of my unfortunate place in the history of computing. Um, I thought I was born in the wrong time. I would think to myself, um, I was born long after the glory days of hacking and the computer revolution. So when I was growing up, I wished I'd been there during the events that Levy relates. Like, um, I wish that I'd been, been able to play Space War in the MIT AI lab. I um, wish that I could have attended the meetings of the Homebrew Computer Club with the Steves, Wozniak, and Jobs, um, or work at Bell Labs with Kernighan and Ritchie hacking on C and Unix. Um, I remember reading and rereading um, Eric S. Raymond's jargon file Many of you have probably uh, seen this. I hope some of you have seen it at least. Um, on the web as a teenager and, and sort of like consciously adopting it as my own culture and like uh, taking the language from the, from the jargon file and including it in my own language. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised to find out that uh, many of us here today like to see our work as a continuation of, say, the Tech Model Railroad Club or the Homebrew Computer Club. Um, and certainly the terminology and the values of this conference, like open source, for example, have their roots in that era. Um, as a consequence, it's easy to interpret any criticism of the hacker ethic, which is what I'm about to do, um, as a kind of assault. Um, I mean, look at this list again, right? To me, even though I'm about to like launch into a polemic about these things, they still make sense in an intuitive and visceral way. Um, how could any of these things be bad? Um, but the tenets and the effects of the hacker ethic deserve to be re-examined. Um, in fact, the few years, uh, the, the past few years have been replete with critiques of hacker culture, um, especially as hacker culture has sort of evolved into the tech industry. Um, and I know that many of us have taken those critiques to heart, and in some sense I see my own process of growing up and becoming an adult uh, as being the process of recognizing the flaws in this ethic um, and its shortcomings and, and becoming disillusioned with it. Um, but it wasn't until I uh, recently actually read Levy's Hackers um, that I came to a full understanding that the problems with the hacker ethic lie not simply in the failure to execute its principles fully, um, but in some kind of underlying philosophy of the ethic itself. And so to illustrate, I want to um, relate uh, an anecdote from the book. 
Um, so this anecdote uh, relates an event that happened in the 1960s in which uh, a hacker named Stuart Nelson uh, decided, to re decided to rewire MIT's PDP-1. Uh, the PDP-1 was a computer shared between multiple departments and because only one person could use the computer at a time, its use was allocated on an hourly basis. You had to sign up for it. Um, Nelson, along with a group of onlookers who called themselves the Midnight Computer Wiring Society, um, decided to add a new opcode to the computer by opening it, fusing a couple of diodes, then reassembling it to an apparent pristine state. Um, this was done at night, in secret, because the university had said that tampering with the computer was against the rules. Um, and the following quote tells the tale of what came next. The machine was taken through its paces by the hackers that night and worked fine, but the next day, an officially sanctioned user named Margaret, Margaret Hamilton um, showed up on the ninth floor to work on something called something called a Vortex model for a weather simulation project she was working on. The Vortex program was at that time a very big deal for her, um, or a very big program for her. Um, the assembler that Margaret Hamilton used with her Vortex program was not the hacker written Midas assembler, but the Dexapplied applied decal system that hackers considered absolutely horrid. So of course, Nelson and the Midnight Computer Wiring Society, when they tested the machine the previous night, had not used the decal assembler. They had never even considered the possibility that the decal assembler accessed the instruction code in a different manner from, the Mi from than Midas a manner that was affected to a greater degree by the slight forward voltage drop created by the addition of two diodes. This is like a really, I probably should have cut out more of this quote, but <laughs> this is the hardware in my talk right here. Um, uh, uh, the slight forward voltage drop created by the addition of two diodes between the ad line and the store line. Margaret Hamilton, of course, was unaware that the PDP-1 had undergone surgery the previous night, so she did not immediately know the reason why her Vortex program broke. Though the programs often did that for various reasons, this time Margaret Hamilton complained about it and someone looked into why, and someone else fingered the Midnight Computer Wiring Society, so there were repercussions and reprimands. Levy clearly views this anecdote as an example of the hacker ethic at work. Um, if that's the case, the hacker ethic in this instance has made it impossible for a brilliant woman to do her work, right? Um, for Levy, this story is passed off as a joke, but when I first read it, I got angry. Um, the Margaret Hamilton mentioned in this story, by the way, is, in case you were curious, is the same Margaret Hamilton who would go on to develop the software for the Apollo program and the Skylab program that um, landed astronauts on the moon. She's like a, a superstar. Um, the mention of Margaret Hamilton in this passage is one of maybe three instances in the entire book in which a woman appears who is not introduced as the relative or romantic interest of a man. And even in this rare instance, Levy's framing trivializes Hamilton, um, her work and her right to the facility. She was a beginner programmer who was officially sanctioned but also just showed up. Um, and she complained about it leading to repercussions and reprimands. Levy is all but calling her a nag. Um, so. If the hacker ethic is good, um, how could it have produced this clearly like unfair and horrible and angry making situation? Um, so I'm going to look at a few of the points from Levy's summary of the hacker ethic to see how it produced or failed to prevent the Margaret Hamilton situation here. Um, so first of all, the idea that access to computers should be unlimited in total. The, the hacker, Nelson, succeeded in gaining total access. Like he was, he was enacting this part of the ethic. But what he didn't consider is in the process, he did not uphold that access for another person. Another person was denied access by his complete access. Um, two, all information should be free. No one who really believes in the idea that all information should be free would start a secret organization that works only at night called the Midnight Computer Rewiring Society. Um, Information about their organization clearly was not meant to be free. It was meant to be secret. Um, three, the mistrust of authority. Um, the mistrust of authority in this instance was actually a hacker coup. Uh, Nelson took control of the computer for himself, which wasn't decentralizing authority. It was just putting it into different hands. Um, four, hackers should be judged by their hacking, not bogus criteria such as degrees, age, race, or position. Of course, Hamilton's access to the computer was considered unimportant before her hacking could even be evaluated. And as a side note, it's interesting to note that gender is not included among the bogus criteria that Levy lists. 
um, that may be neither here nor there. Anyway, the book is replete with examples like this, like just like every page, especially in the first half, is just like um, some hackers being awful and then Levy excusing them because they're following the all-important hacker ethic. So after reading this, I thought, this isn't what I want my culture to be. Um, and then I asked myself, given that I grew up with the idea of the hacker ethic being all important, what assumptions and attitudes have I been carrying with myself because of my implicit acceptance of those values? Um, so many of the tools that we use today in the form of hardware, operating systems, applications, programming languages, even our customs and culture um, originate in this era. I take it as axiomatic for this discussion that the values embedded in our tools end up being expressed in the artifacts that we make with them. I'm not a historian, but I am an educator, and given the pervasiveness of these values, I find myself constantly faced with the problem of how to orient my students with regard to the mixed legacy of hacker culture. How do I go about contextualizing the practice of programming without taking as a given the sometimes questionable values embedded within it? Um, one solution is to propose a counter philosophy, which is what I'm going to do in just a second. Um, but first, I want to, I think I found like the philosophical kernel of the hacker ethic um, that makes me uncomfortable. Levy calls it the hands on imperative. Um, and here's how he explains it. And hands on imperative, I'll talk about this in a second. But, um, Hackers believe that essential lessons can be learned about the systems, about the world, by taking things apart, seeing how they work, and using this knowledge to create new and even more interesting things. They resent any person, physical barrier, or law that tries to keep them from doing this. Um, this is especially true when a hacker wants to fix something that, from his point of view, is broken or needs improvement. Imperfect systems infuriate hackers whose primal instinct is to debug them. Um, Hands-on, of course, is a phrase that has like immediate, incredibly positive connotations. Um, and if you have a choice, obviously, if you have a choice between hands-on and not hands-on, you're probably going to choose hands-on. And so I, I admit that criticism of, of something called the hands-on imperative seems counterintuitive. And this is kind of, I think, like the subtlest and most abstract part of the talk and the part that I'm least sure of. Um, so thanks for sticking with me through this. Um, but here's, if, if you kind of unwind the hands-on imperative, um, you, can, you can pluck out some presuppositions from it. One is that the world is a system and can be understood as being governed by rules or code. Um, two, anything can be fully described and understood by understanding its parts individually, divorced from their original context. Three, systems can be imperfect, which implies that a system can also be made perfect. Um, and four, therefore, given sufficient access, potentially obtained without permission, and sufficient debugging, it's possible to make a computer program that perfectly models the world. So the hubris inherent in the hands-on imperative is what convinced Stuart Nelson that his modification of the PDP-1 would have no repercussions. He believed himself to have a perfect understanding of the PDP-1 and failed to consider that it had other uses and other affordances outside of his own expectations. The hands-on imperative, in sum, encourages an attitude in which a system is seen as just the sum of its parts. Um, the surrounding context, whether it's technological or social, is never taken into account. Um, but that's just a small example of this philosophy in action. Um, there's a, a big discussion in, in many of the fields that I'm involved with right now about bias in algorithms and bias in statistical models and data. And there's always one contingent in that discussion of scientists and programmers who believe that they can eliminate bias from their systems if only they had more data or if they had a more sophisticated algorithm to analyze the data with. And following this philosophy, programming is an extension of uh, sort of Western logical positivism, which says that you start with a blank slate and with enough time and application, adding fact upon fact and rule upon rule, the map becomes the territory and you end up with a perfect model of the world. Of course, programming doesn't work like that. Knowledge doesn't work like that. Um, nothing works like that. Bias in computer systems exists because every computer program is by necessity written from a particular point of view. Um, so what I tell my students in introductory programming classes is this, programming is forgetting. And this is both a methodology and a warning. Um, the process of computer programming is taking the world, which is infinitely variable, 
uh, mysterious and unknowable, if you'll excuse a little uh, turn towards the woo in this talk, um, and turning it into procedures and data. And we have a number of different names for this process, scanning, sampling, digitizing, transcribing, schematizing, programming. Um, but the result is the same. The world, which consists of analog, phenomena, infinite, and uh, unknowable, is reduced to the repeatable and the discrete. Um, in the process of programming or scanning or sampling or digitizing or transcribing, much of the world is left out or forgotten. Programming is an attempt to get a handle on a small part of the world so we can analyze and reason about it, um, but a computer program is never itself the world. So I just want to give some examples. Oh, this is like, <laughs> I shouldn't have left this slide in here. This is um, reality is the whole pie chart. And then our, our digitized version of it is that, that little sliver. And depending on how, how seriously you adhere to this philosophy, that sliver is like infinitely small. Um, we can only ever get like, we don't know how much of reality we're modeling in our systems. Um, so I just want to show like some examples to, to drive this point home of computer programming being uh, kind of um, forgetting. So a good example is the digitization of sound. So sound, of course, is a continuous analog phenomenon um, caused by vibrations of air pressure, which our er ears turn into ner nerve impulses in the brain. And the process of digitizing audio captures that analog phenomenon and converts it into a sequence of discrete samples with quantized values. In the process, information about the original signal is lost. You can increase the fidelity by um, increasing the sample rate um, or increasing the amount of data stored per sample, um, but something from the original signal will always be lost. And the role of the programmer is to make decisions about how much of that information is lost and what the quality of that loss is, not to eliminate the loss altogether. Um, sometimes forgetting isn't a side effect of the digitization process at all. So this is JPEG compression, for example. So the JPEG, the compressed version, is supposed to look worse than that, but when the lighting isn't great, you can't really tell the difference. Um, sometimes forgetting isn't a side effect of the digitization process, but it's express purpose. So lossy compression, like JPEG, is a good example of this. The JPEG compression algorithm converts an image into the results of a spectral analysis of its component chunks, and by throwing out the higher frequency harmonics from the spectral, the spectral analysis, the original image can be approximated. Um, using less information, which allows it to be downloaded faster, for example. Um, and in the process, of course, certain details of the image are forgotten. Um, databases are another good example of programming as a kind of forgetting. So, and maybe this is a little bit less intuitive. Uh, this is a, a table schema written in SQL, clearly intended to create a table, um, like a, if you're not familiar with database design, a table is sort of like a, a single sheet in a spreadsheet program. Um, with four columns, this is a database with four columns, an ID, a first name, a last name, and a gender. So this database schema looks innocent enough. You've probably, if you've done any computer programming, um, you've probably made a table that looks like this at some point, even if you've just made a spreadsheet or like a sign-up sheet for something. Um, but this is actually an engine for forgetting. Um, the table is intended to represent individual human beings, but of course, it only captures a small fraction of the available information about a person, um, throwing away the rest. This particular database schema, in my opinion, does a really poor job of representing people and ends up reflecting the biases of the person who made it um, in a pretty severe way. It requires a first and last name, which makes sense maybe in some Western cultures, but not others, where names maybe have a different number of components or the terminology first and last name don't apply to the, to the, to the parts of the name. Um, the gender field defined here as an enumeration assumes that gender is inherent and binary and that knowing someone's gender is on the same uh, level of the hierarchy uh, for the purposes of identifying them as knowing the person's name. Um, and that may or may not be a useful abstraction for whatever uh, purposes the database is geared for, but it's important to remember that it's exactly that. It's an abstraction. Um, whoops. So the tendency to mistake the discrete map for the analog territory is particularly strong when it comes to language. Um, and that's my, the main uh, focus of my practice is I do, I do computer-generated poetry, so I think a lot about computers and language. 
Um, the tendency to mistake, or um, in my experience, most people conceptualize spoken language as consisting primarily of like complete grammatical sentences um, said aloud in turns, bounded by easily distinguished greetings and farewells, and that we can take these exchanges, like a conversation, for example, and given sufficient time and effort, we can perfectly capture a conversation in a transcription, right? Um, this slide is from a, a paper um, by Mary Buchholz, a, a linguist. Um, it's called, the paper is called The Politics of Transcription. Um, and the paper uh, talks about how anyone who has actually tried to transcribe a conversation uh, knows that spoken language consists of frequent false starts, repetitions, disfluencies, overlaps, interruptions, utterances that are incoherent or inaudible or even purposefully ambiguous. Um, in the paper, she also argues that there is no such thing as a perfect transcription. Um, that interpretive choices are always made in the act of transcription that reflect the biases, the attitudes, and the needs of the transcriber. In other words, a transcription is an act of forgetting, um, of throwing away part of a phenomenon in order to produce an artifact more amenable to analysis. This is from a transcription of, uh, uh, I think, a court proceeding having to do with uh, the Rodney King uh, case in the 90s. Um, and you can see like on the left is like a reporter's transcript of that and on the right is like a linguist transcript of it and they're very, very different. But even the linguist transcription isn't perfect. Um, one thing I like to have my programming students do is read this paper and then try to transcribe a conversation just to see the difference between how they think a conversation works and how it actually works. Um, and of course, the, uh, the problem with, uh, with language isn't just about conversation. The process of converting written text to digital text has its own set of problems. This is an example of an optical character algorithm that's designed to be accurate for some kinds of English text, but it fails to work properly when it encounters, say, the long S of the 1700s. Um, so it says inoffensive manners, and the OCR algorithm thinks it says inoffensive manners. Um, So, or the, there's an obscure ligature in there, which it interprets as like a parenthesis and a five. Um, so the point of this is that the real world always contains something unexpected that throws a wrench into the works of the procedure, right? Um, I'm gonna maybe skip over some of this stuff because I wanna have more time for the last section, but another example of that, this is um, the Unicode standard is devoted to um, the ideal that text in any writing system can be fully represented and reproduced with a sequence of numbers. So we can take a text in the world, convert it to a series of Unicode code points, and then we have accurately represented that text. Um, so this idea might make intuitive sense. It makes especially intuitive sense to like a, a hacker, a classic hacker who's used to working with like ASCII text. Um, but of course, just like any other system of digitization, Unicode leaves out or forgets certain elements of what it's trying to model. So this is one controversial example of Unicode's forgetfulness. It's called the, the Han unification, um, in which the Unicode standard is attempting to collapse similar characters of Chinese origin from different writing systems in the same code point. Um, of course, what the Unicode consortium says is the same, and what the speakers of the languages in question say are the same don't always match up. Um, and the disagreements about that continue among the affected parties, delaying and complicating adoption of the standards. So you can see here, like, the Unicode standard wants to say that all of these characters are the same, um, but you can see that, like, actually, as they're used by speakers of these different languages, they're not the same at all. So there's, like, a, a difference between the abstraction and the reality. Um, this is a, a kind of cool, interesting example. This is um, a system of uh, transcribing dance and movement called um, Laba notation. So you could potentially like transcribe somebody's movements or, or like a dance piece into this particular transcription system. Um, and I bring this up to show that like, I, what I'm trying to say is not that like transcription or digitization or programming or designing like hardware with a particular purpose has, is like always a bad thing. Like it can have a particular purpose. Um, this system, for example, facilitates the repetition and analysis of an action, so the patterns can be identified, formalized, and measured, right? Um, so, here we go, toward a new hacker ethic. So, um, the approach in which programmers acknowledge that programming is in some sense about leaving something out um, is opposed to the hands-on imperative, um, as expressed by Levy. Programs aren't models of the world constructed from scratch, 
but takes on the world, carefully, carefully carved out of reality. It's a subtle but important difference. Um, in the programming is forgetting model, the world can't be debugged. Um, but what you can do is recognize and be explicit about your own point of view and the assumptions that you bring to the situation. So um, the term hacker still has high value in tech culture. And it's a privilege. Um, if somebody calls you a hacker, that's kind of like a compliment. It's a, it's a privilege to, being, to be able to be called a hacker. And it's reserved for the highest few. And to be honest, I personally could take or leave the term. I'm not like claiming to be a hacker or to speak on behalf of hackers. Um, but what I want to do is I want to foster a technology culture in which a high value is placed on understanding and being explicit about your biases, about what you're leaving out, um, so that computers are used to bring out the richness of the world instead of forcibly overwriting it. Um, so to that end, I'm proposing a new hacker ethic. Um, of course, proposing a closed set of rules for virtuous behavior would go against the very philosophy I'm trying to advance. Um, so my ethic instead takes the form of questions that every hacker should ask themselves while they're making programs and machines. Um, so here they are. Instead of saying access to computers should be unlimited in total, we should ask um, who gets to use what I make? Who am I leaving out? How does what I make facilitate or hinder access? Instead of saying all information should be free, we could ask what data am I using? Whose labor produced it? And what biases and assumptions are built into it? Why choose this particular phenomenon for digitization or transcription? And what do the data leave out? Um, instead of saying mistrust authority, uh, promote decentralization, we should ask, what systems of authority am I enacting through what I make? What systems of support do I rely on? How does what I make support other people? And instead of saying hackers should be judged by their hacking, not bogus criteria such as degrees, age, race, or position, we should ask, what kind of community am I assuming? What community do I invite through what I make? How are my own personal values reflected in what I make? So you might have noticed that there were two final points, the two last points of Levy's hacker ethics that I left alone, and those are these. Um, you can create art and beauty on a, computer, on a computer. Computers can change your life for the better. Um, I think if there's anything to be rescued from hacker culture, it's these two sentences. Um, these two sentences are the reason that I'm a computer programmer and that I'm a teacher in the first place. And I believe them, and I know you believe them. And that's why we're here together today. Uh, thank you. <laughs>